Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. And in this module, we're going to talk about managing safety hazards. Safety hazards, as CompTIA sees it, deals with these types of exam objectives. You will be asked about this on your exam. And it talks about uh, the importance of safety and environmental issues. Also talks about implementing safety procedures, including electrostatic discharge. That's something we talked about in a previous video module. And the proper disposal procedures for batteries, display devices, and chemical solvents. We're going to show you how to do that in this module as well. You're going to learn a number of things in this module. We'll talk about, of course, identifying those hazards, especially when it deals with power, high voltage. We'll go through how we can take preventive action to make sure that these hazards don't happen, that we don't have accidents to begin with. We'll discuss ways that we can handle environmental accidents and human accidents if they are to happen in our workplace. And we'll talk about why it's important to have a way to report the incident. And finally, we'll talk about some of those disposal procedures we were mentioning earlier and something called material safety data sheets and how to handle those hazardous chemicals. In our environments where we're dealing with a lot of technology, we will always end up dealing with a lot of electricity. And there are a number of components within your computer systems that have very high voltage associated with them. The first one we'll talk about is your power supply. Well, it makes sense that your power supply is going to have a lot of voltage in it. It takes 120 volts here in the United States where I am. It's different voltages around the world, of course. And we use alternating current in the US to provide uh, into that power supply. And that power supply is going to convert that into direct current. Not only direct current at 3.3 volts, but also 5 volts and 12 volts. And that's provided directly to the motherboard. We're going to make sure that we're careful about this because that power supply is always going to maintain a charge inside of it, even when the system is unplugged from your power source. There is still high voltage inside of those power supplies. Fortunately, it's very easy to replace these. It's also very inexpensive to replace these because we don't want to open those systems up. Power supplies have a, a label on them and it says no user serviceable parts inside. And the reason for that is it will electrocute you if you happen to touch some of the components inside of those power supplies. Don't put any hands in there. Don't poke any tools into the slots around a power supply. That is something that you should leave that very protective metal case around. Make sure you don't go inside any of those. Another source of very high power is your monitor, if you have a CRT monitor, a cathode ray tube. This obviously does not apply completely to LCD monitors, which of course they, they use a lot of power as well. But the power inside of a CRT monitor and these cathode ray tubes, there are very high voltages associated with those, even when they're unplugged. Again, there's even thousands of volts that can remain inside of some of these older CRTs. Fortunately, some of the modern CRT monitors have something called bleeder resistors. So when they're turned off, they discharge internally faster than some of the older systems. Now, if you are using any type, whether they're older or they're newer, when you open up one of those monitors, you want to be sure to discharge the power that is stored up inside of that CRT monitor. So if you don't know anything about that, if you've never done that before, you're going to want to bring in somebody who is professionally trained to do that. Very important. Don't open a monitor case. Don't pull the back of it off. It has a message on there that says, warning, high voltage inside. You don't want to go in there unless you know what you're doing. Don't put hands inside of that. And again, don't poke any tools inside of those slots that are outside a monitor. Those are there to let the air flow through it, not to allow you put to have any access to the systems inside. Now, most of the new monitors you're going to find are liquid crystal display. They don't maintain a high voltage inside of them. As it turns out, there's not much you can do inside of an LCD monitor either. So there's not much reason to go inside of one of those. But the, the possibility for this high voltage doesn't exist so much inside an LCD as it does some of the older CRT systems. So how can we prevent some of these environmental hazards that are going on around us? Well, certainly we've already talked about preventing 
these problems when dealing with high voltage equipment. But there's some things that we can do in our workplace. For instance, we could try to keep all of this workplace very clean uh, so that it's very tidy and you're not tripping over anything. Be surprised how many trip and fall accidents are involved in manufacturing environments. You don't want to be in that situation when you have a lot of different computer components around. You're bringing in computer systems. You're putting them down so that you can address them later. Make sure you put them out of the way. You're not in a situation where people can trip over those. When you're working with electricity and electrical devices, liquid is also a problem as well. You often see outside some of the larger uh, rooms that are, have a lot of equipment inside of them, no liquids and no drinks and no food allowed inside of this room. And that's because that can be very dangerous, not just to the electrical equipment, but dangerous on some of these floors. You can also have a slip and fall problem there. You want to be sure to avoid those types of environmental problems. Some of the problems that you'll find in the environment are situational. These days, we're working a lot with wireless. And you're finding that uh, you're putting these antennas outside of your building so that you can have better access wirelessly, perhaps, to a building that's on the other side of your campus. Uh, there is surprisingly people that are still electrocuted every year by putting up antennas on their house and putting up antennas at work because they happen to touch an electrical cord, electrical uh, process, electrical system that's outside there. Make sure that you've done a survey before you put any piece of antenna up that you're avoiding any power lines that are coming through those systems. It's perfectly clear you couldn't possibly touch anything else that's around that antenna. You also find atmospheric problems as well. You don't want to use any of your electrical equipment during a thunderstorm. Antennas especially you don't want to be installing or messing around with when there's any possibility of electricity or electrical strike in the area. And when you're moving equipment, make sure that you use the appropriate appropriate moving equipment to be able to move things around back and forth. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen somebody moving their office equipment in their chair because their chair has wheels on it. You see somebody pushing the chair down the hallway. If there was something that jumped out in front of them, they happened to run into the side, everything in the chair would fall out. That would probably create a problem, not only break the equipment that was in the chair, it might fall on someone else. It's definitely an, an environmental hazard that's very, very easy to prevent. Let's talk a little bit about disposal procedures and what we would be disposing of in our environment. Uh, interestingly enough, computer systems and electronics in general have a number of components to them that are relatively hazardous if you were just to throw them in the garbage and send them off to your landfill. So with every single piece of equipment that has this type of hazardous material, you will find something called a material safety data sheet. We'll often see that abbreviated as an MSDS. If you want to look through some of those uh, out on the United States Department of Labor, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, they keep a list of all of these and they keep PDF files. You can read them from the manufacturer at OSHA.gov. They have anything in there, all of this information you would need for all of these hazardous chemicals. And look at all of the different devices where hazardous chemicals might come from. The display devices, batteries, CRTs, solvents, ink cartridges, and toner cartridges. You didn't think that what you were printing out actually has harmful, but it is when it's in that, that very collapsed area you're throwing it into uh, the the normal garbage, it's going to a landfill, which eventually that landfill, some of the chemicals will find its way back into our drinking water. So you want to be sure to dispose of these things properly. On an MSDS, you're going to find a lot of different kind of kinds of information, not just about the company and where these batteries or this hazardous material came from, but how to store it, what you should do if you happen to have a problem, if some of that chemical gets on you, gets in your eyes, gets on your skin, it will tell you what you can do in those situations. And when you have those accidents and you need to know how to handle those situations, that's a great place to go is to look at the MSDS. Well, we've talked about preventing accidents, and we've seen where we can find information about some of the hazardous chemicals that are in those. But occasionally, there will be accidents that happen in the workplace. We need to know how to handle that. You may be asked about this, certainly, on the A-plus certification exam in a scenario of what should you do if there is this type of electrical accident. So I've put a few notes here to let you know that here are some things you should think about when there is an accident dealing with electricity. First, you want to make sure that the victim of the electri electrical hit or the electrical strike or someone who's touched an electrical component is away from the power source. Often when someone gets a shock, they're, they're unconscious. And so you want to be sure that they're nowhere near the power. And if they are, you want to turn the power off. So it's very useful to know where the emergency shutoff is for the power. 
in any case, when it deals with an, a, a shock of electricity, you want to be sure to call emergency services immediately. In the United States, we call 911. We want to be sure we get an ambulance or somebody who's professionally trained in medicine to be there and help that person with whatever might happen. When you're dealing with electricity, there's so many problems that can occur to the human body. Make sure you get the emergency services there as quickly as possible. Chemical accidents are a little bit different. Uh, and when you're dealing with that, it can come from anywhere. It can come from a battery or cleaning supply. And it requires a little bit different handling, not just in how you store that, but if there is a problem with that. What I did on this slide is I took right out of an MSDS the health hazard data out of that section that explains if you inhale it, here's what you should do. If it touches your skin, wash it off. Every single device, every single uh, battery, cleaning supply, everything that's a hazardous material will have a different set here. So make sure you refer back to the MSDS or at least have those available to you so that if somebody does get that on your skin, you can look it up very quickly and find out what you're supposed to do. Sometimes you may need to clean it with water. Sometimes you don't want to put water on it. So it's very important that you know exactly what to do. And of course, again, call emergency services. Get some medical help for that person immediately. You should also know how to handle physical accidents when working in the environment because we have all of this different kinds of equipment we work with. Physical accidents can, can also be a problem. These are very common when so much computer hardware is around. So you want to know where your first aid kit is. Make sure that you know if there's a problem, there's some type of medical condition. You want to be sure that you have something available to address it as quickly as possible. If there's ever any concerns about the health and welfare of someone, you want to be sure and contact the emergency services immediately. No questions. It's always better to be safe than sorry. And asking the injured person if they are, if they are OK and if they need medical help isn't often the best course of action because they may not, not be in the best position to make that decision. If somebody's injured, you need to be the one to size it up and determine, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and call. I know you're saying we shouldn't call anyone, but I just saw you get hit in the head with a computer system. We're going to go ahead and call somebody and make sure that you're OK. Better to be safe than sorry. Incident reporting is often the drudgery part of this. When there's a problem and something happens, you have to do some paperwork. And nobody likes doing the paperwork. But nobody also likes having long-term problems that tend to happen over and over and over again. One of the most important reasons for documenting the situation is so that you can be sure that the situation doesn't happen again. And if there is a trend of problems, you have a way to go back and see that this is something that's happened over a long period of time, and now you can justify resolving it. In organizations that are relatively large, you'll find that this reporting process is formalized, even if you're not aware of it. And you can often find it on your intranet, uh, ask the people in your HR department, what's the proper way to do this? The legal department may also have information on the reporting process for these problems. You want to be able to document as much as possible. You never know uh, which shift you might have where this problem might happen again when you aren't there. And you need to put down as many details as possible. If you have no other method available to document this, use something that you can track, like email, or have something written down that you have in a book so that you can go back over time and look to see when that incident happened that you did document that there was a problem so that you can reference that later. And those problems are something you can put into the past and resolve them as quickly as possible. Well, to review our module on managing safety hazards, we talked about not just identifying where the hazards might be coming from, but we talked about how we could take preventative action so that these problems don't happen to begin with. If we do have hazardous materials, we do need to know how to dispose of them. And if there are accidents that do occur, whether it's environmental or human accidents, that we know what to do first. And of course, we talked a little bit about making sure that at the end of this, that we do have a way to document and report on when that incident occurred. For more A-plus certification training, if you'd like to make a comment about this video or discuss anything else with others in our forums, be sure to visit our website at freeaplus.com.